Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, it's Jessa here for another episode of Better Sex Podcast. I love being here. I am excited to share inspiration, stories, information, insight, ideas, all this stuff to try to help you have your best possible sex life. That matters to me, and that's why I'm showing up to do this. Today is a personal story, and if you've been listening for a while, you know I do these every once in a while. They are identified in the list of podcasts, so if you like them, you can find the other ones that I've done. And I want to invite you to be interviewed on the show if you're willing to share your personal story. I do these anonymously, so nobody needs to know it's you. But if you've had a journey around sex, if you've had challenges that you've overcome or experiences that you think other people would relate to or benefit from hearing about, I would love to talk to you. So you can email me at change, C-H-A-N-G-E, at jessazimmerman.com, or you can follow the links through the uh, bettersexpodcast.com website. Get in touch. I would love to be doing more personal stories. I think they're really impactful. I think they're important for people to hear, you know, the inspiration and the successes, but even just to know how normal sex is in all the ways that it happens for us. You know, everybody's had a different journey and they're all normal. And I just think that's so important. So my guest today, Emily, is a young woman who agreed to share her story. She started out in a sex positive household with a, with no shame about sex, like a very good attitude about sex, and yet had her own struggles, you know, had her own insecurities and fear of rejection and things that she came to see were really interfering in her ability to develop a relationship and then a sex life. And so she has overcome this largely and is here to share the story. So I hope it's got meaning for you and I hope you enjoy it. So Emily, thank you so much for coming on the show to share your story. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm glad. I I feel like these personal stories are really impactful for listeners. So I appreciate you (laughs) being willing to talk about what's happened for you. Of course. Well, I'm a big fan of the podcast, so I'm excited to be a part of it. Oh, thanks. So where do you want to start your story? Like, you know, we we don't need to go back to, you know, when you were two years old, but um, where does your story start? Well, it's a it's a broad question, but I would say probably around age 16 was sort of the first time that I sort of felt like I was, you know, becoming a sexual person. Okay. And it was, you know, that was it was probably no earlier than that that I started thinking that maybe I wanted a boyfriend or a girlfriend. I'm bisexual. I had come out to my friends and my parents by that point, but it was sort of at that point, I was 16, I was in high school that I sort of started looking around and thinking, okay, like I would be interested in pursuing a romantic relationship at this point in my life. All right. So you, when, when did you get clear that you were bisexual? Oh, pretty much as early as I can remember, probably age 10 or 11. Okay. All right. So when you say at 16, you were starting to feel like a sexual person, you mean in terms of maybe sharing sexual experiences with somebody else? Yeah, I I had a conscious thought before I turned 16 that I was not at all ready for sex. My my two best friends at the time were both a couple years older than me. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of reached that point earlier than I did. And I remember, you know, watching them get their first boyfriends and lose their virginities and thinking, good for you, but I am not ready for that. Okay. And then at about 16, that changed. Okay. So you felt ready at that point for boyfriend or girlfriend. Okay. And then what, 
what happened? Well, so I was in high school and I went to a very small high school and I didn't feel like I had a lot of options to pursue a relationship in high school. There wasn't really anyone that I was particularly interested in. And I also felt that even though it was such a small school, there was, of course, still a group of the cool kids that I didn't really feel like I was a part of. And so in in a lot of ways, I didn't feel like I was really an eligible bachelorette, for lack (laughs) of a better term. So even though I was kind of wanting a relationship, I, I didn't feel like I could find one. Okay. And I guess from the way you're talking, high school was the only place that you could imagine that happening. Like there, it wasn't like you were in, I don't know, there were some other places you could have uh, found a relationship. It didn't feel like that. I mean, it was a small high school in a small town. It's not like I went to summer camp or or anything where (laughs) I could have been exposed to a different group of people. Okay. Or in a big city where there'd be a lot outside of your high school or something like that. Right. Right. Okay. Okay, So you're starting to feel this desire and yet there's not, there's no options. Right. There's not an outlet for it. Okay. And so I I didn't end up dating at all in high school. I graduated high school never having, you know, had a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And then I went to college and I moved um, to a big city for college. And I was really excited that that would change everything and that I'd be <laughs> in a much bigger group of people. I'd be in college. I'd be getting out of my comfort zone. And I would just have, you know, all the options in the world to date. Okay. But and I guess, that, and I guess, have sex. This is on your mind, right? Like, oh, I can finally have sex. Yes, that too. Okay. Uh, so I was excited about that, and um, that didn't end up totally panning out either. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I got to college freshman year, and I was in a, a dorm of students that ended up all becoming pretty close friends and spending almost all of our time together. So, kind of, I don't know if it was you know, subconscious or just total cir- like happenstance. But I ended up in a similar dynamic almost to my high school, where it was, again, just uh, a small group of people that I was spending all my time with. Okay, and none and of then, them are real options. And it feels too, I mean, I guess I hate the word incestuous, but that, you know, like too, <laughs> too close. I've, I've used that word for it. Okay. Well, it, in this case, I did have more options. Okay. Uh, they just didn't end up being good options. There was one guy that I was sort of immediately infatuated with freshman year, though he made it very clear to me and pretty much to everyone else that he was not looking to date at Uh, that point. Okay. Um, And so, you know, in hindsight, I definitely should have taken him at his word and, and moved on. But at the time, I just thought, oh, maybe he would change his mind. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so I think, I think a lot of us have probably been there. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up basically for my first two years of college being sort of hung up on him. We had sort of an ongoing friends with benefits sort of relationship. And though it started when I was still a virgin, I ended up losing my virginity to him sophomore year of college. Okay. Which all in all was a positive experience. At that point, I was very ready. And because I was 20 years old, losing my virginity kind of felt like a hump that I had to get over. Okay. So you felt good about that. I did. Yes. I mean, I was, I was raised in a very sex positive household. And so I was, excited about the thought of, you know, exploring my sexuality, having casual sex if I wanted to. But I knew all along that I wanted my first time to be a a more meaningful experience with someone that I knew and was really comfortable with. And so I felt like I had to kind of get that out of the way first before I could get a little more casual and experimental in my sex life. Okay. So this was this felt meaningful to you because you knew the person. You were comfortable with them, even though he wasn't he didn't want to date. He didn't reciprocate your feelings. This was still a positive choice. It was. It okay. was because he was someone that I, like you said, that I knew that I felt comfortable with. And I was, you know, it was it was the right time for me more than anything else. Okay. At that point, it, it became a little less about the person that I was with as it was about it felt like the right choice for me. Okay. That was my sophomore year of college. That's when I had sex. And then After that, I was still hopeful that maybe it would turn into a more significant relationship with him. Mm -hmm. 
but by the time we got to junior year, he had developed feelings for someone else. Okay. Uh, And so even though he and I hooked up, slept together a few more times after that, he then started dating somebody else, which sort of was a blow to me. I didn't see it coming. Mm. Um, I didn't get a lot of notice. And that was sort of a shock. And after right, that, he happened, wasn't supposed to—he wasn't supposed to be dating anybody, right? It wasn't. At least right. that's what he—that's what he'd said. Okay, <laughs> right. And so when that happened, it, it kind of took me by surprise, and I had to kind of look around and say, okay, the the one person that I had focused all my attention on was now involved with someone else. Our relationship was over, and here I am, halfway through college, still never having had an actual, you know, monogamous, serious relationship. Okay. So that was sort of a turning point for me because I was looking back and wondering why I hadn't, you know, branched out, why I had sunk so much time into someone who I had, you know, known from the beginning was not going to lead anywhere. And I had a bit of an epiphany after that, that I definitely had a pattern of investing my feelings in people who I knew were unavailable. Oh, I, I knew I had had, you know, smaller crushes over the years with people who were in relationships mm. or like in the case of this guy, someone who I knew was not interested in dating me. Yeah. And so I had to kind of do a little reflection and ask myself, why was I finding myself the most attracted to people where it was clear that there was no future there? What um, was your answer? Well, what I what I landed on after lots of thought, was that I was very afraid of being rejected. I had a a pretty deep-seated fear that no one I liked was going to like me back. No one I was romantically interested was going to feel the same way. And so I was choosing people who had an obvious reason why they wouldn't like me back Mm. so that in my own head, you know, when they inevitably rejected me, I could say, oh, it's just because they have a boyfriend or it's a not girlfriend, me. Right. Not, because it, not because it's me. Okay. So I sort of figured that out towards the end of college. It was very eye-opening. You know, looking back, I could see all these patterns that I had. And what I sort of decided to do about it was to just make a conscious effort to actually ask for what I want. To, to actually to do something that scared me and go out and actually pursue something that, you know, I might actually not get. So but, are you, yeah. I mean, are you like that as a person <laughs> that you just have an epiphany and turn on a dime and then just sort of do something about it? Kind of, yeah. I mean, okay. I, I don't, that's not to say that it's always successful or that I always <laughs> kind of figure it out on the first try. But yes, as long as I can remember, I have been very, very kind of self-reflective. I do a lot of sort of analyzing my own behavior. And I do like to think that if I, if I kind of discover something about myself that I don't like, or that I want to change, or that I realize has been holding me back, I do then make a conscious effort to change that. Okay. So what you, so what you're figuring out at this point in the story is that what's holding you back is this fear of rejection and that you've not actually put yourself out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was sort of the point, you know, by, by my senior year of college, I was trying to find ways to sort of get out of my comfort zone. You know, there still wasn't anyone around me, any one specific person that I was, you know, interested in enough to really go out there and pursue. Mm -hmm. But more and more, I was just trying to think, you know, what can I do to actually put myself out there and, and risk rejection more than I had been before? Okay. And then what actually became a really, really interesting experience for me and a really important experience for me was my senior year of college when I was taking a human sexuality course. I, um, I was just taking it as an elective. I thought it would be a fun class. Yeah, I bet. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, but we had an assignment. We had to write an essay. And the assignment for the essay was to do something within the realm of sex and sexuality that we had never done before. And, you know, obviously this is a, this is a class in college. This is a teacher giving an assignment. So we were not by any means told to have sex or do something dangerous or anything like that. But it, it, you know, it could be something as small as going to a sex toy store or having a conversation, you know, with your parents about sex, if you had never done that. Oh, okay. So something that would sort of push you person, each person personally in some way to grow. Okay. Exactly. And it was totally up to us what we wanted to do. Um, And then we were to write a paper about the experience. Okay. And so what I ended up doing was I made a profile on a a dating app called Field. I don't know if it's still around. (laughs) You know, it's, it's very similar to Tinder, except that you can make profiles as a couple. So it's sort of, it's geared towards, you know, less traditional relationship. So you can go on there looking for threesome partners or for open relationships or okay. things like that. And I had heard about this app and I just thought I'll make a profile on there and, and check it out. So was and that I, that was your stretchy thing is I'll just go on this new dating app? That well that um I I was trying to decide what I wanted to do for okay. my paper topic. And that was something I was trying where I thought maybe I would go on a date with somebody in a context where it wasn't Tinder or Bumble that's a little more straightforward. Okay. So I, I had this paper assignment. I decided to make a profile on this app just to kind of check it out. And I put on this app on my own profile that I was bisexual, that I was interested in threesomes, that I was looking for a couple. And it was, you know, it was something that I had always been interested in that I always thought maybe I would want to try. Oh, okay. So this had been on your mind before. It had, yeah. Okay. And I ended up matching on this app with this couple, you know, who were who were my age, living in the same city, but, you know, said that they had they had never had a threesome before. It was something that, you know, similarly they were interested, you know, considering and just kind of seeing what was out there. Yeah. And and we matched and we started messaging on this app for a couple of days. They seemed like, you know, cool people. And I ended up meeting them for drinks. And again, that was going to be at that point the thing that I was going to do was right. going to go <laughs> have a date, have a date with a couple. Have a date with a couple because you know, and and this even that was was very much outside of my comfort zone because I am not someone who makes like meets new people very easily. I, I have a, a decent amount of social anxiety. I don't really like small talk. I don't really like you know totally putting myself out there like this. Okay, um, so that was going to be a big enough step for me. So I, I went and, and met them for drinks and we ended up having a great time and, and really hitting it off. And after that night, I think, you know, all three of us were kind of thinking like, oh, this was something that we didn't actually think there was any chance of happening. But yeah. here you go. We actually all like each other and definitely have a good vibe together. And so the three of us kind of started seeing each other. This was a boyfriend and girlfriend who had been dating for about two years. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, they were a very solid in love couple. They were living together and they had never had a threesome before, but were interested in trying it. We ended up sleeping together a handful of times. And what was really cool about it for me was at that point, I had still not had a serious relationship of my own. Right. And all of my sexual experiences aside from actually losing my virginity with a you know a friend who I knew were pretty casual. Okay. So with this experience I actually kind of got to experience what relationship sex was like. Hmm. Um because you know this couple sort of you know invited me into their relationship and yes it was very non-traditional sex but it was still very intimate and emotional and um 
that just something that I hadn't experienced in with my own sex life before. That. Now, were you experiencing that firsthand with them or were you watching their relationship sex? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, um, I don't, it was, it was kind of both, I guess. I mean, I definitely, I was watching them, but I couldn't help but be included in it given the situation. Okay. Yeah. And I don't mean it. Yeah. I'm not talking about the sex itself, right? I'm talking about the emotional relationship quality of it. Like, you know, like you're just exposed to their relationship or, but I guess you're saying you felt like part of it too. Like it did rub off or or you were invited in. Yeah. Yeah. Rub off, rub off is is probably a good, kind of a good way to put it. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and that was that it kind of changed my perception because I had always kind of had an idea. I mean, ever since I was 16 and kind of decided that I wanted a boyfriend, I sort of had an idea in my head of what just kind of intimacy with a partner would be like, Okay, but I hadn't ever experienced it. And right. then I, I got to see it and somewhat feel it. Okay. Firsthand, which really kind of, I mean, I, I had I had wanted a relationship before that, but after I was kind of like, now I actually have a frame of reference in my mind of, of what it could be like and what I'm looking for and, and the sort of thing that I'm, you know, I'm not going to settle for less than that with anybody. Okay. So that was a, a turning point. Yeah. And so this is what you wrote your paper about, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be yeah. curious what the, te- <laughs> the teacher's getting all these things about people buying their first vibrator or talking to their parents and then she gets yours. <laughs> that is that is what I wrote my paper about. And I was expecting, you know, when I got it graded and got it back that I would, you know, she would have some comments about it. But I mean, I don't know if it was the most, you know, out there thing that she'd ever read about because she'd been teaching this course for years and yeah. I think had the same assignment every semester. Right. But I think she had a policy of of not reacting to uh, anything that she read in order to, you know, not not yeah. ascribe any judgment. And so, you know, I got an A on the paper, but she didn't comment on that. <laughs> really. I her credit for going <laughs> above and beyond, right? Okay. <laughs> Hey, I'm just taking a quick little break in the middle of the show. Most of you probably know, if you've been listening at all, that I have written a new book called Sex Without Stress. But what you may not know is that I have developed an online course to support you through the process. The book has a lot in it. (laughs) It's a do-it-yourself process to totally transform your sex life, but it's hard to do it. And it's hard to do it alone without support. So I have been looking for a way to create an environment that's supportive and could help you actually get the stuff done. So what I've done is create an eight week course. There are webinars that you can watch live or you can watch later. There's materials, there are exercises and directions, and then I'm going to offer live online office hours. This is where you can get questions answered and get input on your situation. It's not therapy, but it's a a place to come and help you move through the process. The next cohort starts January 28th, 2019, taking enrollment all the way up until then. You can learn more at sexwithoutstress.com. Easy to find the online course information there if you want some more information. I would love to have you join me. So the turning point you really you wanted a relationship you got a sense or a context for what you were looking for and weren't going to settle for less what about the whole risk taking risking rejection you know those aspects of your i mean did all of that evaporate in the course of this experience um it certainly didn't evaporate but it was really good positive reinforcement okay um, because what i had done in this situation was completely put myself out of my comfort zone I, you know, I was really open about something that I wanted. I mean, it's not, you know, even for someone like me, who's pretty comfortable, you know, talking about sex and very comfortable with with my sexuality, it's not that easy to, to go, you know, to strangers basically and say that like, I'm interested in having a threesome. Yeah. (laughs) And so I had, I had totally put myself out there. I was totally just honest and forthright about what I was looking for and I ended up getting it, and it was a very positive experience. Okay. And so it was very good reinforcement that 
if I actually kind of go out into the world asking for what I want, you know, forcefully, that I can actually get it. And so it, it definitely showed me, you know, that I should live more like that on a daily basis. Okay. Which is the lesson that I, that I you know, took from it after that going forward. So tell us a little bit about how the story has turned out so far. Because okay. you said you slept with them a handful of times, so I guess that, that ended. It did. Um, the two of them actually ended up breaking up mm-hmm. <laughs> for, for reasons that I think were hopefully unrelated to me. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so that, that ended after a couple of weeks, which, you know, was, was a little disappointing, but I, I, I didn't see it. You know, it, it was a sexual experience for me. I wasn't interested in, you know, being in a three person relationship like right. that, like actually, you know, dating to other people was not something that I was interested in. So obviously, you know, I, I knew it was a temporary thing going into it. That ended after a couple of weeks. But then, like I said, I kind of now had this fresh idea in my mind of, of what I wanted. And so I, I got back on the, on the more conventional dating apps, <laughs> um, because it seems like that's really the only way to meet people nowadays. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was only a couple weeks before I actually met my now boyfriend on Bumble. Oh, okay. And it was, it was sort of because I, I went back into it with this newly focused effort. I mean, all throughout college, I was, I was on these apps intermittently thinking yeah. that I was looking for someone to date. But, you know, I, I, I didn't use, I didn't go on them that often. And then maybe I would talk to someone for a couple of days and the conversation would just sort of fizzle. I, I would kind of let it fizzle because I wasn't super invested. Um, but I sort of really went after it with a, with a newfound focus after that um, and ended up matching with my current boyfriend. And, and now we've been together for a little over a year and it's everything that I, you know, have been wanting since I was 16, basically. Wow. And I definitely know that it, it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't really set my intention hmm. of, of knowing what I wanted and, and going out and finding it. Yeah. So would you say, I mean, did the, the threesome experience and that intentionality behind that, I mean, did that get rid of all the demons? Was it, was it, was it that easy? I mean, not like that's everybody's answer, but I mean, was no. it, was it turning on a dime? Cause sometimes change is, is that sudden, you know, and sometimes not. It was a really sudden change in my awareness of the problem. Okay. You know, the, the, the epiphany that I had in college after my, you know, casual relationship with this friend sleeping with this friend of mine ended that felt very sudden. Yeah. It was sort of like all, all of a sudden I had figured out kind of what my core problem in this area was. Right. And then, you know, it, it was a longer process of sort of figuring out, okay, now that I know what the problem is, how do I address it? Right. And that's how I ultimately came to the conclusion of, okay, I need to be much more focused and intentional and kind of, and brave for lack of a better term about going out and actually asking for what I want. Okay. And then the the experience with the threesome sort of validated that as a right. good strategy. Okay. And then I maintained that strategy to to go out and, and meet my boyfriend. Right. But that it has certainly not gotten rid of all my underlying insecurity. I mean, I still have a, you know, very frequent voice in my head that you know, I'm going to, I'm going to lose what I have or mm-hmm. that even, I mean, cause it's, it has been an issue in my, in my, in my friendships too, in my social life, not just my dating life uh-huh. where I worry that, you know, the people that I like and the people that I want to be around for some reason don't feel the same way about me. It's just, it's an irrational fear that I've had, you know, for most of my life. Okay. So uh- those voices aren't gone. The fear is not like banished in this experience, but you've been able to to act differently, I guess is how that sounds. Exactly. Yeah. You get a, so, diff- you get mean, a different result too. Right? Yeah. I'm, I'm sure it'll be a, a lifelong process of really overcoming that. Or, I mean, hopefully not lifelong, hopefully. 
<laughs> Hopefully just another couple of months. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I, I hope that with enough, enough positive reinforcement throughout my life in, in the relationship that I'm in now and future relationships, I can, I can really fully overcome that. Yeah. But no, that has, that has been a, a very much an ongoing struggle, but it helps to have, I, I do sort of feel like I've figured out what the exercise is that I need to do to sort of overcome it, but it certainly is going to take lots and lots of effort to, to overcome it all the way. Right. Or practice, I guess. I was, that's how I put it to clients. Things take practice. Yeah, exactly. And is there anything, it, I mean, you may not, there may not be anything, but I'm wondering if there's anything you have to share or want to share about evolving your sexuality over the course of, you know, first casual relationships or just friends with benefits to the threesome to your now boyfriend, what you've developed in, in understanding your sexuality or your own pleasure or your own, you know, how sex has changed for you in those different contexts. Sure. I mean, I, um, I mean, like I said, I, I was raised in a very sex positive household. I never felt any, um, real, you know, shame or discomfort with my sexuality or sex in general. Um, When I, even before I had ever had sex, I felt like I had probably a much more sort of mature and realistic view of what sex was and what it meant than the other people around me, whether it was in high school or the first couple of years of college. You know, I always viewed it as something that was you know, very positive and, and meaningful and an important part of life and an important part of any romantic relationship. But, you know, it, it's sort of the difference between theory and practice, right? right? Like right. I, I had a very, I think I had a very good idea about what a, a healthy, happy sex life was like, but I just, I didn't fully appreciate it in practice until I experienced it firsthand. And it is, I mean, you know, the difference between a one night stand or a casual hookup and having sex with someone that you're in love with, you know, for me anyway, is night and day. Yeah. And the threesome was, was enjoyable. It was fun. It's something that I could you know, potentially see myself doing again in my life, but it's not necessarily like that is not necessarily something that I think is, is going to be a regular part of my sex life. I mean, mm-hmm. really what I got from that was an understanding of what having sex in a monogamous relationship is like. And now that I am in a monogamous relationship, that's all I want. Yeah. And as we were preparing for this episode a little bit, you shared with me that sort of metaphor you had about food and how this relates to, you know, these experiences that you've had. Yeah. It's a metaphor that I've used when I've talked about this with other people that I think is sort of fitting. Um, Pretty much if you think of, you know, meaningful, a meaningful emotional romantic relationship as like a three course meal. When I was in middle school and high school when I was sort of wanting to date but not having the option. It felt like I was looking around and and watching people around me date. And it was sort of like watching them all eat food when I had never tasted food before. So sort of a sense of of envy and, and wanting to try that but not being able to. And then when I got to college and and had my first sort of you know, ongoing relationship with the guy that I lost my virginity to, it felt um, as though I was kind of really smelling food or maybe getting a couple crumbs of it because it was, um, you know, I was closer than I had been in high school, but it still wasn't satisfying by any means. Yeah. And I think you were getting crumbs in maybe more than one way. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yes. Very, very much so. Um, And then when I had the the threesome experience that was sort of like tasting food for the first time because it was my first actual first hand experience with what emotional intimacy and, a, and an emotional ro- romantic relationship felt like so I got a little bite at that point and then after that you know you have a little bite of food and you just want more <laughs> right so that's when I really it really sort of um 
put the fire under me to, to go out and get it for myself. And now that I am actually in a relationship and, and have a boyfriend and I'm in love for the first time, it feels like I've really gotten to actually eat a whole meal and I finally feel satisfied. I'm, I, I no longer have this kind of aching in my stomach that, that was there since I was 16. Yeah. Well, and you've got a seat at the table, it seems to me too, right? There's an inclusiveness at the, in this that seems relevant. Absolutely. And it's also, it's a, it's an important frame of reference. I mean, just like the, the threesome was kind of my initial frame of reference. Now this, you know, my current relationship has replaced it as, yeah. you know, this is what a relationship feels like. And, and now going forward, you know, I'm never going to be settling for anything less than this because right. you don't go back to crumbs after you've actually eaten a meal. Right. Right. Very good point. But yeah, so that's, that's my, that's the food metaphor. Yeah. I appreciate it. Th- I mean, I just think that's lovely. It's a nice way to describe it. So I guess the last question I have for you is if um, if you have a takeaway, like, you know, we've got the listeners, nobody's got your story, of course, and not everybody's going to relate to what you've been through. But what would you, what would the core takeaway be that you'd pass along to anybody that, that wants a lesson from from your story? The biggest lesson that I just took away from it personally is that, um, you really can't expect to get what you want if you don't ask for it. Ah. You really, you know, whatever it is in your life, and it doesn't have to have anything to do with sex or relationships, but if you want something, you have to put yourself out there because you're not going to, you're not going to achieve anything without taking some risks. Yeah. And I know I actually recently started reading your book and I think you have a similar thought in it, which is, which is that you should ask for what you want without being afraid of hearing no. Yeah. Which I read and, and appreciated because that was already sort of what I, the idea I had in my head from, from my experiences. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. something I, I say to clients. So I appreciate that. Yeah. So, you know, put yourself out there and, and if you're ever going to have a threesome, talk about it a lot ahead of time, establish <laughs> the ground rules. <laughs> Yeah, that's a whole other conversation, I suppose, is how you prepared for it and negotiations or whatever. But, you know, we'll leave that. So, well, thank you so much for taking the time to share the story. I, I think it will impact people. So I appreciate it. I hope it does. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, There are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.